Good morning, everyone. I have a couple housekeeping things I'm going to go through before we get started. So thank you for joining us for another virtual breakfast. Uh, just some friendly reminders. Please mute yourself, mute yourself during the presentations. Please sign in with your first and last name. If that's not appearing when you sign in, uh, what you can do is click on the participant list, find your name and hover over that, and then click more to be able to rename yourself. Uh, we're going to be asking questions in the chat box, which is uh, located at the bottom of your screen. And then the RUP and CCA codes will be given at around 7.30 at the end of our uh, presentations from our, from our two specialists. MSU Extension programs are open to all. The collection of demographic data from program participants is an important and mandated aspect of all Michigan State University Extension programming. This is voluntary and the information that you provide will not be used in any way to identify you personally, but rather as a member of a group that participated in this program. A link has been shared in the chat. We ask that you take a moment to fill out the information. Thank you. So before we get started, I'm gonna briefly introduce uh, myself and our speaker. My name is Monica Jean. I'm a field crops educator located in the Saginaw Bay region. Um, and today I'm gonna to be hosting Vicki Marone, who is a specialist for the MSU Center of Regional Food Systems. And she specializes in organic farming systems for both vegetable and field crops. And today she's gonna go over those systems with us and give us some tips and tricks for organic production. Vicki, I'm gonna go ahead and let you share your screen. Okay, good morning. Thanks for this opportunity to share with you today. And note my contact information is here and also at the last slide, if you ever have additional information or questions or would like some more information, feel free to reach out to me anytime. So today, we'll, let's talk about what is NOP, National Organic Program Certified Organic, and why Michigan field crop farmers go organic. What are some basic steps and what are some examples of Michigan farmers making it work? And then I've created a resource page for you uh, that will be available in the chat as a, as a link. Where can you go for more information? The USDA National Organic Program started in 2002. And that was uh, after many states had their own program. This made it a nationwide regulate, regulatory program. And it provided unification so that if a product was sold across state lines, um, it was the same system that produced it and would be under the same certification. It takes about three years. It does take three years from the last non-organic input till the third year when a farm or a practice can be certified through the USDA as organic. Note that organic inspection is an annual event, not just your first year to become certified, but each year. And the cost is typically around $1,000 per production system. Meaning, for example, if you have field crops and poultry, that would be two different systems. Uh, you can get some refund through the USDA Farm Bill, and that may change through each uh, time that there is a uh, Farm Bill. Um, last go around was seven hundred and fifty dollars, uh, with seventy five percent. And this year, it, this Farm Bill, it's five hundred dollars or fifty percent uh, return uh, for the expenses of certifications for each year, and you can do this each year. So let's meet some organic farmers. I have uh, been working with these families for several years and have the pleasure to share with you a little bit about them. Randy and Shirley Hampshire from Kingston, Michigan are organic farmers in um, both dairy and field crops. And they've also in the past dealt with vegetables, organic vegetables. And then Jim and Deanne Saddleberg from Munger, Michigan, which um, this family has started a, uh, not only production of beans and uh, grains, but processing of dry beans. And then Paul Triber from Munger, Michigan, and is a farmer who, organic farmer who produces primarily uh, beans with rotations of various grains for um, sale at local markets like Organic Farmers of Michigan Co-op. 
So first, uh, Randy Hampshire. Randy and Shirley, his wife, have five daughters who um, they had the uh, anticipation that of the five, somebody would step up to the plate and recently one has, and they're very excited about that. Randy started out at MSU getting his ag production degree in 1973. And then in 1988, around uh, that time, BST, which is a growth hormone that is uh, fed, can, be, can be fed to uh, cows to increase their volume of milk. And also Roundup came on the scene. And Randy became curious as to what are the implications in terms of his uh, land, in terms of the animals, in terms of the environment. And he started doing a lot of reading and edu educating himself through uh, conversations and attending meetings tried to learn and he decided at that point, and that's 1988, that organic was a, a way to go for him so that he could uh, reduce these inputs and get credit for it in the marketplace. So today, Randy's primary market is Eastern Market at Detroit. And every Saturday you will find he and his family there selling uh, breads, delicious breads and uh, flour, dry grains, uh, dry beans, and uh, once in a while they'll have some value-added sweetbreads as well. They have they have a brick oven that they use. And then, then they also use this opportunity at the market to, to distribute their CSA dairy share. And you see their beautiful cows to the right, their jerseys. The milk is uh, more than just a dessert, huh? It's really, really beautiful to, to drink. And if you've ever tried raw milk, it's, uh, it's a treat in itself. You know, taste that kind of burnt cooked flavor. And then our next farmer we have is Jim Saddleberg and Jim and Deanne Saddleberg in uh, Munger, Michigan. And they've been certified organic since 2002. And four or five years prior to then, um, Jim was working with biology, biology of the soil, trying to get his head around it trying to improve it. And that made him curious as to how he could say, okay, I have this system in place now, how can I make it improve my market opportunities? And that's, he had some background in processing of dry bean. And with that, he created Everbest. And if you go through Munger, you'll see the post office, a little store and Everbest. As you see to the right, it's a very large facility of processing beans, cleaning, drying, and um, packaging them in 50 pound bags. And they do black bean cannellinis and pintos primarily. Uh, Jim also grows corn, soybean, which is the edible grade soybean, clear hylum for Japan, for high grade tofu, and as well as wheat and string beans. And you hear all this diversity of crops, mind you that that's a big part of organic to create a smart rotation, uh, not only for the uh, soil to building, because you've got your legumes and your grains, every root system does a different role on the soil in terms of sequestering nutrients, in terms of recycling uh, leftover nitrogen from the previous year. But he also has a way to reduce pests on his uh, large grass crops like soybean and uh, through smart rotations. And so you'll see that typically in organic farms, uh, several crops for rotation. And the stream beans, that's a, um, it's a legume that provides a good contract. Remember, it's not just about taking care of the soil, it's about taking care of your family with finances. So you have to have good contracts. And our third farmer is Paul Triber from Munger, Michigan the farm Fertile Valley Seed Farms. And he has been farming since 2003, where he was doing some contract farming also. And uh, one of the contractors asked him to help them transition organic. He became interested in that process. And as he shares a quote, my father always told me, take care of the land and it will take care of you. I raised sugar beets and transitioned after sugar beets. In four years, I was all organic. And that was in 2003. And he hasn't gone back. He continues to grow only organic. And he has a small acreage. So that was a concern for him um, to say, how can I improve the, uh, my, cost, my return 
on a small acreage. You know, remember the sad slogan of get out or get big? Well, he wasn't able to get big. There were, land was difficult to obtain in his area. And so he said, well, if I can't get big, what am I gonna do? And he saw the opportunity to increase his value. And he has um, taken systems that his father set in place for clean, cleaning seed. <clears throat> and he has made it so that he cleans a lot of his own seed um, and sells it to the Organic Farmer of Michigan Co-op, which is um, based over in the Thumb. And many of the organic farmers over there uh, take advantage of that both to sell and to buy uh, inputs for their for their farm. But it's, they have a marketer who works with them to uh, obtain contracts so that they can bulk their product if necessary to increase their their production and their market opportunities. So some quick steps of, of getting there. First, you have to choose to tr transition. And that's a true commitment because like you saw, it takes three years to transition. So from the last input to three years, you have to practice, fulfill the organic practice uh, requirements. But after that time, you can become certified NO through the NOP, the National Organic Program. Build relationships, not only with your workers, but with your markets, with your neighbors. If your neighbors are not organic, have them help you uh, make a go of it. You know, we hear challenges where conventional farmers and organic farmers side by side have challenges. And that's important to build that uh, relationship early on so that they understand what you're trying to do and you build respect for one another. Um, get your families engaged. And those are very basic steps. And then you start doing the, the physical, the tangibles, improving your soil, um, getting a good soil test and recognizing that as your baseline of where you go from there. Identify sources of organic inputs, gain knowledge through workshops, through meetings like this morning, and uh, farm, farm organically for three years uh, using organic practices, and then you choose your certifier. Uh, and that certifier can come from anywhere in the U.S. Uh, we do not have certifiers, in fact, in Michigan. So obviously you can't choose one from Michigan, but you, it's up to you. Choose anyone that is USDA uh, certified. And then you align your markets to meet your organic products and then keep learning. Every day we keep learning. I love going to organic farms and talking with the farmer because I learned so much and uh, just sharing ideas. We get new ideas for not only research, but just how to do things in a more clean, simpler way. Consider higher value markets, engage in a co-op or some sort of marketing system. Do you realize that there's 811 Michigan organic certified farms and 404 of them grow certified organic field crops? That's grains, beans, uh, pasture, hay. Of the 404 farms, 210 produce USDA NOP certified organic seed for, for commercial companies like DF Seed and Blue River Seed. Working with the farmers co-ops can make a big difference, not only in a market opportunity, but in education. Uh, help you make a better product, help you uh, deliver in a more timely fashion uh, in delivering a better product cleaner and uh, recognizing the percent dryness that's needed. And you also have the chance as in a co-op to bulk your harvest, to uh, have access to different contracts. So, the priorities when you're becoming certified is to first gain an insight into organic production. Um, visit farms, talk with farmers, go to a couple organic conferences, build your soil. Um, and you heard how Jim Saddleberg four years prior started working with soil health before he even thought about organic because we all recognize without good soil, you can't get a good crop. Develop a weed control plan. Yes, weeds are probably the Biggest challenge, as uh, Jim Soderberg said, weather these days has become a problem because it impacts his ability to get out and control the weeds. Weeds in organic are typically controlled either by mechanization or uh, electricity. And these days they have uh, not only LP, but uh, electric type of system to zap the weeds at a field scale level. 
secure your sources of organic inputs, whether that's for manure or seed, and then identify your organic markets. And with that, you can achieve good organic production. I've created a resource list for all of you, and hopefully it'll be shared in the chat as a link. Um, I've shared it with uh, Monica. Monica, were you able to do that? I, yep, I already shared it. Excellent. So there's um, some resources for you, not only on education aspects, but um, a guidance to select the appropriate cover crop mix or cover crop uh, species, and then some resources that can help you in obtaining your needs to meet for organic production. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us. And I look forward to your questions later on after, the, after Jeff shares with us about this dry weather. And we're gonna blame Jeff for that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Vicki, we did have one clarification about raw milk in Michigan. Um, isn't yeah. it not eligible to be sold? It can be sold through a CSA only. Okay. Uh, I just want to mention that the resource list that Vicki spoke about earlier, I'll make sure to have that on the social me media pages too, just in case you missed that. And um, if you like to get on and uh, view the podcast, podcast, I'll make sure to put that list also in the podcast description. So that should be accessible to everyone. All right. So there was a couple comments um, that I just want to make sure uh, that's shared. There's Midwestern BioAg, and Vicki said it's another very important resource for organic farmers to help them understand their soil needs and health. So you can add that also to the list of resources. And then do you have a listing of approved soil amendments that are available here in Michigan? So it's the, the available here in Michigan. That's why I created that resource list. But if you ever question if a product or a, an input is allowed in organic, your best course of action is to go to omri.org and they, and I've just put that acronym in the chat, and that stands for Organic Material Review Institute. They're based out of Oregon. And what that means is, say, for example, uh, Herbrooks or, or, or Dairy Dew has a new product they want to assure that uh, it's a mix, a blend. It can't be just straight, or straight manure, but say there's a fertilizer blend that they want to have checked or... Um, so they would send that, of course, there's a fee for that to OMRI. They would review it for how it's not only what its ingredients, but it's process. And if there is an OMRI label on that, then you can be rest assured that, well, pretty assured that it's allowed and organic. It's always important to check with your certifier prior to adding a new input to your system because things change, because uh, the OMRI approval may have happened three years ago and the company has since changed the input into, into or the process of how they made that. But always check with the certifier and you say, well, what if I'm transitioned and I'm not, I don't have a certifier yet? I have yet to find a certifier that is not willing to talk to a, a person who is transitioning. They're very uh, eager to share their knowledge. Mind you, they can't advise you as to what's the best input or what's the best crop to grow, but they can give you the guidance around the NOP regulations always. And they're there for you. And um, Leon also asked a question about uh, hay and uh, wondering if there are organic opportunities for forage and hay in Michigan. And I mentioned that Organic Valley and uh, Horizon both have organic dairy farmers here in Michigan, but also connecting to the co-op. Once again, connecting to a co-op helps with your market opportunities. Organic Valley co-op you connect to because I obviously have lots of uh, dairy cows in their um, ranks. But also there are many farmers who want organic non-certified. So if you say you're in transition and that farmer is looking for organic hay, but they're not certified organic. They just want the fact that they know it hasn't been sprayed with Roundup or 
it hasn't been sprayed with um, a, a pesticide that is uh, an organophosphate. Mind you, there are pesticides in organic, just not organic organophosphates. We have insecticides and fungicides that are, a, we say a softer pesticide. They're typically contact pesticides, meaning when they touch the insect or they touch the fungal organism, that's how it kills, not systemically through the vascular system of a plant. So uh, it's important to check with your certifier before you apply any new thing. And yes, there is opportunity to sell organic hay, probably not as much as organic vegetables, but, um, but organic hay stores, that's another virtue of doing uh, field crops. They store, whereas if you have fresh vegetables, you either process them or lose them if they don't sell that day. So does that, I hope that answers your question um, and happy to clarify if needed. So that, so you, you can get that list. You can also, um, Omri will sell you a book if you prefer something tangible in your hands. I think it's like $11 for each, um, each year because it updates every year. Um, Great, thank you, Vicki. And I wanna second that Omri, I use that very often when I get calls about organic. It's, they've got a great search bar that you can just type in what you're looking for. So it's a very user-friendly website as well. Um, it looks like we're getting some uh, crop and pest questions here. How is the heat impacting grain fill in wheat? That's beyond me. <laughs> I'm seeing here if uh, if we have Dennis Pennington on, or if Man yeah. Manny's on. I don't know yeah, if Manny. he has any. Matilda has an answer for everyone. Yes, beat it. Why <laughs> did you have a question? Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Good morning. This is Dennis Pennington. Um, yeah, question about is the heat impacting grain fill? And yes, I think the heat is impacting grain fill. Hopefully the, the comments that Jeff made about it cooling off next week is going to be true and that will, that will really improve uh, grain fill for wheat. But yeah, um, there's some areas that still are very dry yet um, that, that the dryness itself, not just the heat, is also impacting grain fill on wheat. So. Yep, we could use that good uh, day-long soaker. Uh, it's what we really need. Great, thanks, Dennis. Sorry, I didn't see you on there with your iPad Pro name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. That's all right. Um, and then it looks like we have a pest question. How early in the summer could spider mites become an issue? Are there any insects or disease we should be concerned about right now with the hot and dry weather? So that's like a Marty Chilver slash um, if Chris Stefanzo's on. Come on. All right. Uh, well, we did find soybean aphid, the first ones in the suction traps uh, from a sample from last week. So they're just, you know, kind of starting to fly. That's nothing to worry about. It's just that they're, they're beginning to colonize soybean fields. And some of you planted really early. So there will be soybeans up for them to find. So you may get a little, you know, a little bit of, aphid here and there. Usually for spider mite, we think, I, I think about 4th of July as sort of a starting point uh, for, for spider mite and then increasing, if we remain dry, increasing into that late July time frame. And, and I actually think spider mites are the toughest thing to manage because, you know, spraying is a losing game typically as well. And, and they're hard to um, scout, scout for. Um, what else have we found? If you ha if you're interested in the in the grub kind of situation, uh, the grubs are pupating Asiatic garden beetle in southeast and southwest Michigan. We're finding pupae, so that the feeding by grubs is actually ending at this point. So you shouldn't have any other problems with those annual grubs. And other than that, you know, dry weather sometimes a lot a lot of moths like western bean cutworm, European corn borer moths. They need water to make eggs. If if they don't have water and dew, then they don't you know, it's hard for them to make eggs or the eggs dry up. So yeah, some things like the, the sucking pests tend to be worse under dry weather or be ad advantaged, but, but there's other insects that are, that are not. 
So as this evolves, probably like by beginning in July, I have stuff from 2012 that I can send out and publish. And I think we'll see how things are shaping up then. I basically just dodged everything, the whole question. Just, <laughs> That's okay. Oh, and I did find and, a corn borer. So there were, there, the corn borer flight has just started. So that was okay. uh, last week, at least in central okay. Michigan. Yeah, on the, right. on the disease side, it's pretty quiet. Um, you know, there, there will be things that will be favored by some of these conditions like charcoal rot. So that's something we might see um, some of. Um, and any, you know, root rot diseases that got started early, that'll obviously show, right, because there's no water. So plants can't recover and any you know, damaged root system is going to exacerbate that wilting. So something to be watching for. But I don't think, you know, overall, we really haven't had those heavy rainfall events, right, for the most part. Um, and so that amount of root rot shouldn't really be there. So uh, pretty quiet. Uh, the powdery mildew and the wheat, right, I mean, that sort of damage is mostly done um, from that. Um, that prefers sort of cool and dry conditions. So the heat we've had will shut it down a little bit. That We talked about it yesterday in that virtual wheat field day. You know, some of those susceptible varieties are pretty well toasted now anyway. So, you know, that's what I've got on diseases. All right. And Marty, I, um, I like that we now have multiple children joining us <laughs> for virtual awesome. breakfast. So thank you. Yeah. Um, we also have a question. This would be back to Vicki. What type of soil test do you recommend for organic field crop farmers? Great question. Thank you for that. So, so of course you want to know your basic nutrients available because all crops, whether they're organic, conventional or whatever, however format you, uh, system you use but you also want to get a baseline when you first start of the organic matter percent organic matter and check that about every three years because mind you that organic matter doesn't accumulate fast it's a slow process it's a slower process in the sandier soil versus a clay soil and um, organic matter is the thing that is important in terms of making the system work for the soil health, the biology of it, as well as the nutrient availability. And when you do take a soil test every year, try very much to take it the same time each year. If it's just after uh, uh, your crop is tilled in, say in September, October, do that every single year because think about what's going on in the soil as you add something to the soil or you disturb the soil through cultivation, you've created a new environment for uh, breaking down of organic material, uh, making nutrients available to uh, the crops or even through leaching. And so uh, if you keep that consistent every year, check for organic matter as well as nutrients. Um, and like I said, every three years for the organic matter and, and see how hopefully it's rising. If it isn't, then you adjust your system. That's the point of a, of, uh, checking your soil, but also you, there's soil health indicators in terms for the biology of it, just to see if you are building, if you're feeding the microbes basically is what you're doing. And uh, if you see that the microbes are high and you uh, sampled in October, and then the next year you sample in early May, they're low, well, think about the system. <clears throat> you've got temperature differences, you've got moisture differences. So that's why you want to keep it consistent across the line. Um, and we say, well, what's the point of, of bio, these microbes in your soil? They are responsible for breaking things down. They're kind of like your food composters right in the soil or your, um, they, they chew on the organic matter, you know, the incorporation of your cover crops and your plant residue, and they help to start breaking it down so that it can release nutrients that can be available to your following crop. Um, and uh, check out the Cornell soil uh, testing as well as the uh, Midwest biosystems. They work a lot on the biology, not just the chemical side of your nutrients, but also your biology side of your, what's available in your soil and how your soil is behaving with your different inputs and your different practices. So I think, All right. thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you, Vicki. Um, how much impact has the later frost had on the wheat crop? I think 
at least in my area, we just had another mm, frost in some parts of the central Michigan region, like last week. Um, Dennis, are you still on to comment on that? Yeah, I don't think the the wheat or the frost, the late frost that we had, it was cold enough to really do that much damage. Um, at this stage of growth, wheat can tolerate down to 28 degrees for about two hours. So I haven't, I guess, literally looked at a map of the state to see how cold it got that one night. It was a Saturday morning, and I had a couple guys text me say I had to scrape frost off my windshield this morning. What's going to happen to my wheat? Um, I've seen a few heads where um, it's pinched off and you can see the frost damage, um, but you got to really look for them. So the, the amount of damage is, is quite minimal, I believe. Yeah, I saw some corn with some uh, yellowing of leaves, but from what I can tell, they've mostly grown out of it. So yeah, although that think... stress from the dryness may not be helping our cause right now, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeff, did you have something you wanted to say? Just to follow up, uh, fortunately, with that event, we we just did not see many areas. It was it was very localized, and in and usually in low lying areas where that cold air drained and, and ponded to get to that twenty eight for a couple hours. There were there were very few spots. Uh, most most areas were a few degrees warmer than that. So that that that's one positive thing uh, about uh, it, it. Just wasn't the magnitude wasn't there. Fortunately. All right, any other questions, concerns, if you could please put them in the chat box or you're welcome um, to, at this point, you can um, unmute yourself as well if you wanna ask a question, if you don't have the abilities to chat, like if you're on your phone, uh, but I'll give it just a minute here. Oh, go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, um, I just wanted to mention uh, that uh, I'm finding more and more aphids and cereal leaf beetle in wheat and other small grains out there. Um, so, I mean, you got to have really high numbers to reach any kind of threshold. Um, and so there, there's quite a few growers that just add an insecticide in when they spray fungicide because they can do it for two or three dollars or maybe four dollars an acre. Um, and, and that kills off all your beneficials. So, um, you know, just, just keep an eye out there for, for cereal leaf beetle and, and aphids. So, so the, the aphids are all coming from this, from the South. So in that, in that, and boy, you'd be hard pressed to have to spray for aphids. I mean, the aphids are building your biocontrol that are going to move into soybean. So I've seen one field in my entire 25 years that I would have sprayed for aphids and it was down in Mason. Yeah. And it was one of those, you know, uh, it, it was a plot. It was like 22 years ago. This, this cereal leaf beetle issue, we're, you're causing that by spraying. I mean, the, the, the parasitoids have been around for a very long time. They were introduced by USDA in the 50s and 60s, starting in Michigan. Michigan pioneered that. And the, this putting the $2 whatever into the, that, that's what I think is creating this increase this, you know, high uh, wheat management kind of thing may be good for, for other parts of, of, of the wheat crop, but just putting that insecticide in without needing it, you certainly don't need it for aphids for the, for the, for the most part. And, you know, use the thresholds for cereal leaf beetle. And um, so Dennis, you bring up a really good thing is that this is how you spray your way into a problem which you see in Iowa and Minnesota and all these places where they typically do that. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cause those, those are overwintering locally. Those beetles are lazy and they're, they're going to overwinter in, in those field edges and, and uh, the ditch banks and the woodlots besides. So you're getting those beetles back uh, any that have been sprayed and survived. Lazy beetles call for good IPM practices. A lot of Thank lazy insects Chris. out there. Right. All right. Uh, I just wanted to point out that Vicki shared her contact information for anyone interested in um, reaching out to her for some more organic questions. And for those of you that can't see the chat, it her email address is s-o-r-r-o-n-e at msu.edu or 517-282-3557 to give her a call. So thank you, Vicki, for, for doing that. Um, not seeing any more questions or comments. There, there was a question oh. from Lyndon about um, cutting and then spraying of forages. 
So the, so the beauty of cutting is that you actually kill some of the weevils that are there. And then if it's dry, you expose them to dry kind of conditions and sun, you know, so that, that would kill more. Um, but, and then if you are going to need to spray, then you're not spraying a big canopy, you're spraying a six inch growth if you absolutely need to. Now, again, parasitoids play a really important role with alfalfa weevil too, but there is a threshold and it's per square foot. So going out with a sweep net isn't going to help you with weevil. You're, you're literally looking at a kind of like a, eyeballing a square feet of row and saying, do I have six to eight big dudes still feeding? Now, based on the timing, we should be close to feeding being done with a lot of the weevils and you may even see the little pupil cases that are kind of like a little mesh bag that's kind of in the residue or 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 on the plant and if and if you have that then then the feeding is starting to end and i think that perhaps uh let's see if i've addressed lyndon's question um i don't know if i've i've lost it so i don't know uh what else he's asked maybe products you got pyrethroids for the for the for the most part. Oh, he might have asked about potato leaf hopper, and in that case, a sweep net is appropriate. And uh, if you're at if you're at eight to twelve inch, that's one per sweep. And as you get smaller, if you're looking at new growth, it's about twenty per hundred sweeps or 0.2 leaf hoppers. I don't think in point twos. I think in whole leaf hopper numbers. So twenty per hundred sweeps. All right. Thank you, Chris. Is anyone else? I guess some people are sending them privately, so I didn't see them. So is there any other questions out there? That may no? have been a private message from Lyndon, but I didn't determine that. That's so. okay. We I all needed like, to hear about Weevil. Yeah, so. yeah, that's perfect. All right. With that then, Phil, any anything else to cover? I think we're good, Monica. Great. Well, thank you again for joining another um, virtual breakfast and hopefully we see you all next week. Have a great week.